sir can i allow everyone okay okay Can I start, sir? Yes. Good morning and warm welcome to Anandya Anastasia postgraduate teaching program and Zoom platform sponsored by Akhila and hosted by Avon Logics and simultaneously aired by Anastasia TV. Today we are starting with the first session of obstetric anesthesia. The first topic is physiological changes of pregnancy by Dr. Akhila Deswari. She is working currently as a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institute. She has graduated from SRMC RA in 1995 and had done an MD in Madhuri Medical College. Her area of interest is pediatric anesthesia, obstetric and airway. She is an active mem member of ISA and executive member of AOA India and IAPA Tamil Nadu. She has written chapters in books, post cesarean analgesia, transdermal drug delivery, awareness under anesthesia, management of high risk obstetrics. She, uh, she was the scientific committee in charge for the national AOA conducted in the Chennai in 19, uh, 20, 2019. Uh, thank you. On behalf of uh, Anil Anastasia, we welcome you, madam. Over to you, madam. You can share your screen. Yes, but I can start. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. I will thank the entire uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Edward Johnson and the entire crew members who have been uh, doing this wonderful job of uh, uh, the teaching postgraduates, uh, especially in this morning session of uh, Sunday. Uh, good luck to you, Dr. Edward Johnson, and all the other crew members. Uh, talking about uh, physiological changes in uh, pregnancy and their uh, anesthetic implications, let us. Uh, 
Okay, so the outline of my talk is going to be what are the changes that are occurring in the course of pregnancy? Why do they occur? And uh, what is their course uh, uh, with regard to first trimester, second trimester and third trimester? And uh, do we have any, why do we need to know these and what are the implications for the anesthesiologist? When you look at why these changes occur, mostly these are because of the hormonal changes, namely the estrogen, the progesterone, the relaxin and the sympathetic uh, system, which uh, all gets activated during uh, pregnancy. Uh, these are uh, these uh, hormonal changes uh, act on different parts of the uh, body, namely the cardiovascular, respiratory and all the systems in the body. Apart from this, the mechanical effects uh, of the growing uterus and the fetus also contributes to the anatomical and physiological uh, changes that are occurring in all the systems of the body. Why do we need these uh, changes? Basically, these changes occur to meet to the metabolic needs of the uh, fetus and the mother. These uh, changes, they start uh, as early as from the fourth to fifth week of gestational age. And when you look at the resolution of these changes, they vary. They do not go simultaneously or in a sequence sequential manner, they vary between six hours, 16 hours to 12 weeks postpartum. So for all the changes in pregnancy to wear off, it really takes uh, uh, 12 weeks of uh, postpartum. When you're going on to the initial uh, thing, how much is the, uh, uh, how do we, uh, well, first looking at the changes which occur with the body weight and composition, the weight gain during pregnancy is uh, supposed to be about 17% of your pre-pregnancy weight or at least 10 to 12 kg is the average weight gain for any normal pregnant patient. Out of this, the uterus and the fetus, they contribute about 4 kg. The blood, the interstitial fluid and the plasma volume, they contribute around 4 kg. And the new protein and fat, uh, which, uh, which is being uh, generated to cope up with these metabolic uh, demands in the form of increase in the organ uh, size and in the number of cells, that contributes to another 4 kg. So roughly there is an increase of about 10 to 12 kg in any pregnant woman. So anybody who is going to be a little bit on the overweight side is going to be an obese patient. And a patient who is a little, little bit on the obese side is going to be a super morbidly obese patient. So these, uh, as such, obesity has uh, anesthetic implications. And in addition to this, the physiological changes that are going to occur on the pregnant patient are all going to add on it. This is the split up of the weight gain. And when we look at the systematic changes going to the cardiovascular changes, now looking at the anatomy of the heart, how is the heart being positioned in the precordium? Because of the growing size of the uterus, the heart is displaced upward and to the left. So when you want to do a physical examination and locate the apical impulse, it is located at a higher level, at the level of the left fourth intercostal space, and it lies in the midclavicular line. And the accent, the heart sounds when you look at the S1 is very low because of the increased blood volume and increased cardiac output which occurs. And there can be S3 and S4 heart sounds can be physiological. So, in addition to this, there can be ejection systolic murmurs which are happening uh, in the left uh, parasternal border, which can be flow murmurs or it could be a pathological murmur, which we have to pick up. Then, when you look, take an ECG on a pregnant patient, definitely it shows sinus tachycardia. There can be a short PR interval. Because of the upward uh, shift of the heart, there can be left axis deviation and there can be T inversion in lead 3. All these changes are physiological in nature. When you consider the anatomy, when per se, what are the morphological changes which occur, there is cardiac muscle hypertrophy. When I say cardiac muscle hypertrophy, there is increase in size of the cardiac muscle cells and the type of hypertrophy which occurs is eccentric hypertrophy and it is often a reversible hypertrophy unlike a, a hypertensive uh, uh, cardiac hypertrophy hypertensive patient which we see normally and now what is the difference between a hypertrophy which you see in hypertensive patient and in a pregnant patient is that there is no compromise on the size of the chambers for example severe left ventricular hypertrophy can lead to decrease in the available volume of the left ventricular uh, size 
So this can ultimately re result in impaired diastolic relaxation. Whereas in pregnancy, there is no compromise on the size of the chambers and it is often an eccentric hypertrophy. In addition to this, there is no compromise in the coronary blood flow also because the angiogenesis is supposed to be preserved. So it is called as physiological angiogenesis and eccentric hypertrophy. When you look at the echocardiogram, the left ventricular wall thickness and the left ventricular wall mass increases by 28% and 42%. It is not only the left ventricle which increases in size, there is also increase in the right ventricular mass. There is also dilatation of all the four chambers. Because of this dilatation of the four chambers of the heart, there can be mild annular dilatation of the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve which can lead to mild tricuspid regurgitation or pulmonary regurgitation in an echo. These can also present as uh, systolic murmurs in the left parasternal border. So any systolic murmur, so where, how, when, to, when do we evaluate these patients? Whenever the grade of the systolic murmur is grade 3 and more or a presence of a diastolic murmur, or when a patient has got dyspnea at rest or unexplained uh, fatigability, syncope or palpitations, you evaluate them for your cardiovascularness. Because most often these patients, they complain of uh, uh, some amount of uh, dyspnea on moderate exercise or on severe exertion, which is inevitable because of the changes that are going to occur in the cardiovascular system and in the respiratory system. When you look at the other changes which are happening, as I already told you, there is increase in level of the estrogens and the progesterone. The estrogens, what do they cause? Ultimately, they activate the renin angiotensin mechanism and also they stimulate the aldosterone. So both of these lead to intense sodium and water retention. So this sodium and water retention ultimately results in increase in the plasma volume. The increase in plasma volume which occurs during the course of pregnancy is roughly about 50%. But when you look at the rate of change of increase in plasma, plasma volume, it starts early at the stage of fourth to fifth weeks of gestation. It slowly raises throughout the first trimester. And then there is a rapid rise in the plasma volume at the start of the second trimester. And it peaks at the early part of your third trimester investor where it attains a value of 50 to 55 percent and when you look at the total blood volume that also increases in a similar way but the volume increase is roughly about 40 percent the plasma volume increases by 50 to 55 percent whereas the total blood volume when you see it is it is increasing by roughly about 40 percent so on an average uh, when you calculate it on the basis of uh, blood volume per ml per kg it increases from 76 ml per kg, which is the pre-pregnancy level, to 94 ml per kg. So we have got around 30 ml per kg as a, an extra reserve in a, any pregnant patient who has crossed around 30 weeks of 30, uh, 28 to 30 weeks of pregnancy. Whereas when you look at the red blood cell volume, the rise in red blood cell volume does not correlate along with the, it does not parallelly follow the increase in plasma volume or the increase in total blood volume. It, it, follows, a, it follows a mediocre pattern where the ultimate increase is only 25%. This is the reason why there is a, a little bit, a, pay, a, a person who is having 12.5 grams or a 13 grams per deciliter of uh, a HB to start with, will have some amount of decrease in hemoglobin during your first and second trimester, which is often referred to as physiological anemia of pregnancy. And when you look at the central hemodynamics, what happens to the cardiac output? We are bothered about heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, and the filling pressures of the heart. This is how we look at hemodynamics in any patient. So in a pregnant patient, when you look at the heart rate, the heart rate begins to rise by 15 to 20%. And this start early rise in heart rate is the first one to be achieved. Even before the cardiac output increases, your heart rate increases. The next thing to occur is around an increase in your cardiac output. This increase in cardiac output is because of your uh, we know that cardiac output is nothing but a function of your stroke volume and heart rate. 
So what contributes to the early increase in cardiac output is the heart rate. Whereas after five, eight, seven to eight weeks of gestation, if you look at the graph, you'll see that there is a rapid rise in your stroke volume. This rise in stroke volume reaches about around 35 to 40 percent at the end of your second trimester and it reaches around uh, 40 percent around 30 weeks of uh, 32 to 34 weeks of gestational age. So the maximum increase in cardiac output of about 50 percent when you see this is attained at around uh, 34 weeks of gestation. What is the implication of this increase in cardiac output? So the maximum increase in cardiac output occurs at 32 weeks of pregnancy. So this increase, this increase in cardiac output is primarily brought about by, as I already told you, there is an increase in left ventricular mass. In addition, the plasma volume also increases as told before. So both of it will contribute to increase in end diastolic fiber length. So the blood volume increases by 40%. So the the preload to the heart increases and whenever the preload to the heart increases, the end diastolic fiber length increases, which ultimately re results in increase in cardiac output. So it is both the contractility and the increase in end diastolic fiber length that is the function which ultimately improves your, your uh, cardiac output. And what is the implication of this uh, increase in cardiac output at 32 weeks? So any patient who has got um, a cardiac disease, which is not picked up or which has been compensating for over the years can get manifested at this 32 weeks of gestation. So anyone who's coming with dyspnea or new onset of cardiac symptoms around this time, we should need to evaluate them for cardiac diseases. Next, when you look at uh, blood pressures, there is an overall decrease in your systolic blood pressure, in your diastolic blood pressures, and in your mean arterial blood pressures. But this the decrease is maximum at about mid-gestation. That is around in your 12 to 18 weeks of pregnancy, there is a maximum drop. Why, why, why is there a decrease in this blood pressure? That is because of your decrease in your systemic vascular resistance and your uh, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. And this is because of the majorly because of the hormonal effects which occurs during pregnancy. Now, the SVR, when you look at it, it is reduced by 20%. Whereas your peripheral vascular resistance is reduced by 18%. So uh, a regurgitant lesions, Regurgitant lesions, they do compensate and they adapt well during pregnancy because a, a mildly increased heart rate and, an in, and a, sm a small reduction in SVR is the desirable goal. So these patients, they do compensate well during pregnancy, whereas all the stenotic lesions who depend on the, who have especially a fixed cardiac output, somebody like uh, some, a patient who's having a mitral stenosis or an aortic stenosis, they maintain their blood pressure based on the systemic vascular resistance. So whenever there is a mild fall in systemic vascular resistance, since it is a fixed cardiac output state, there has to be a tachycardia which has to occur to increase the cardiac output. So which is not poorly, which is poorly tolerated by these patients and hence they manifest with cardiac failure. And when you look at the type of circulatory state, it is called as the pregnant patients and low are called as the hyperdynamic circulatory state where the cardiac output is increased and also the systemic vascular resistance is decreased. That is often referred to as a hyperdynamic uh, circulatory state. And uh, over the changes in cardiac output uh, during the pregnancy, we look for what happens during labor. During the latent phase of labor, now it's very important to look at this graph. How are the changes in the cardiac output? There is a maximum percentage change is around 50%. This 50% change, I told you, it occurs in the early part of your uh, uh, third trimester and it is preserved the same throughout your third trimester. After that, there is no major change in your cardiac output. Whereas at onset of labor, what happens is there is further increase in your uh, cardiac output which is around uh, roughly 15% during the latent phase of labor, which increases to uh, above 50% uh, during the active phase of labor. And ultimately it increases to around 125 to 150% during the immediate postpartum period. So why is there an increase in uh, so much of uh, cardiac output? 
This is because, because every time there is a uterine contraction, there is blood which is being expelled into the systemic circulation, which is often referred to as autotransfusion. And labor is a very intense uh, physical exercise where you need a lot of sympathetic activity, which often leads to increased amount of catecholamines with, and they result in augmentation of your uh, stroke volume and heart rate, which also increases the cardiac output. In addition, once the baby is born, the iota cable compression is released and there is improved venous return. So increased venous return, uh, enhanced sympathetic activity and your blood volume increase, all these pushes your patient into a very high state of uh, uh, blood volume, uh, high state of capacitance is needed. So in a patient who has got cardiac disease, what happens is that this is the phase where they will go into pulmonary edema. And there can be unmasking of cardiac disease, something like a peripartum cardiomyopathy, or when there is overzealous administration of fluids and syntocin during the uh, third phase of labor, it can trigger pulmonary edema. And uh, so how do we avoid these increase? So this is the one, the major uh, increase in cardiac output that occurs during the latent phase and the active phase and in the second phase of uh, labor and in the immediate uh, postpartum phase ultimately are the reasons for cardiac decompensation. How do we avoid this knowing this physiology? It is advisable to use neuraxial analgesia during labor and give them opioids so that this sympathetic activity is abolished. So there is a decrease and also by uh, giving adequate pain relief, you decrease the bearing down reflex and uh, associated autotransfusion can also be brought down to a certain extent. And then at the end of the uh, uh, birth of the baby, we can give a dose of Lasix, which will improve in uh, uh, by improving the uh, uh, increased extracellular water that occurs following uh, labor. Uh, and when you look at the distribution of blood flow, what happens is there is, uh, though there is an increase in cardiac output and blood volume and all those things, is the blood flow uniformly increased to all organs when you look at it. There is greater blood flow only to the skin, kidney and the uterus. So when you look at the uterine blood flow, normally it is around only 80 to 90 ml per minute, whereas a term uterus the blood flow is around 1000 ml per minute and the type of flow which you look at it is it is a low resistance circuit and there is nil autoregulation so when the perfusion is entirely dependent on your arterial pressures venous pressures and your vascular resistance of your placenta these are all the things that are ultimately going to decide the fetal well-being. So the one point to remember is your circulation, your uterine circulation has nil autoregulation. And so there is every, whenever there is a, uh, even a 5 to 10% fall in your uh, MAP or your systolic blood pressure prior to the delivery of the baby, it is very important to treat vigorously the hypotension. In addition, when you look at the blood supply to the uterus, it's around 1000 ml per minute. So in case of atonicity of the uterus, within two to three minutes, the patient can just get exsanguinated. He can lose around 50% uh, of the blood volume in two to three minutes. So in no time, you lose your blood and you don't, because it is a compensated system, you don't exhibit features of tachycardia. Whenever there is a hypotension in a pregnant mother, it means we have missed the bus and it is a late omnibus sign of hypotension. So blood loss. And the next uh, physiological change which occurs in cardiovascular system is with regard to the iotocaval compression. What is iotocaval compression? So as the pregnant uterus comes out of the pelvis by 12 weeks of gestation, and when it is around at 20 weeks of gestation, what happens is it presses against the vertebral column and against which the inferior vena cava and the iota are lying on either side. Your inferior vena cava is more towards on the right side and your iota. Though iota is a muscular organ which is non-compressible, because of the weight of the uterus, there is some amount of displacement of the iota which is happening in the supine position which you can look in this coronal section. There can be complete occlusion, occlusion of inferior vena cava when, when the patient lies supine and there can be displacement of your uh, iota to a certain extent and in cases of extreme hypotension, there can be even 
the perfusion to the uh, uterine can also get compressed. So whenever there is a compression of your IVC, what happens is there is a decreased venous return. Whenever there is a decreased venous return, the preload to the heart gets decreased and your cardiac output ultimately comes down. In addition to this, your placental perfusion, as I already told you, it depends upon your arteriovenous pressure difference. So when there is a decreased venous return, which is happening at this level, there is a venous pressure which is getting built up. So ultimately, there is an increased venous pressure in the setting of hypotension, which ultimately results in a compromised uterine blood flow. And there can be fetal tachycardia or fetal bradycardia, which can set in during supine position. This changes can get aggravated during neuraxial anesthesia or during transport of patients vigorously, we all tend to miss. So it's very important that we uh, transfer patients, pregnant patients only in the lateral position, which is very important take home message of this. And how do we avoid this uh, aortic cable compression? So one method is you relieve, you position your patient completely lateral when he or she is not anesthetized. So this will relieve the caval compression and automatically there is improved venous return and your uh, symptoms get relieved. The next thing, especially when you do, when the patient is given regional anesthesia and when there is hypotension, uh, you, you have given vasopressors, you want to relieve the iota cable compression. It is very important you do a manual uterine displacement and the other things which can be done are tilting the OR table to at least 30, 30 degrees to the left. It has been shown previously that even a 15 degree tilt was advisable, but according to the latest uh, current uh, consensus, a 30 degree tilt also has uh, only 80% relief of uh, relieving the iota cable compression. And the next thing which you can do is wedge under the right buttock. So once you know that uh, a neuraxial blockade has been given and there is hypotension, there is definitely going to be some amount of uh, uh, iota cable compression, which is inevitable. So it is very important to treat hypotension vigorously with vasopressors so that the blood flow to the fetus is not compromised. Now, what are the implications of these cardiovascular changes which I've been talk talking about? They usually, uh, because the blood volume, as I said, it increases to about 94 ml per kg. So even when the patient loses around 1000 to 1500 ml of uh, blood, they do compensate very well and they do not uh, uh, have uh, compensatory symptoms such as hypotension, which is occurring. So we tend to underestimate blood loss. That is number one. And in the presence of a resting tachycardia and in a scenario where the baby is delivered, where... Uh, uh, you give syntocin, you give methogen. So your uh, routine vital signs such as your heart rate and BP, they are all confounding factors and may not be reliable. So it's very important to visually estimate the blood loss in the immediate uh, uh, postpartum period and following deliver of, delivery of the baby during LSCS section. The next thing which we have to observe is to uh, uh, communicate with the surgeon regarding the uterine tone. Because this will tell you, because whenever they, they start massaging, it is an indirect clue for you to know that, okay, the patient is losing something and you get ready with your uh, uh, other venous axis and colloids of blood in case if it is needed. So tachyca, you don't wait for tachycardia and low BP to set in in a case of an obstetric patient who are, who's bleeding. And, and this is because hemorrhage can be very rapid and massive as I already told you. The other uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, complication that can occur is there is a risk for pulmonary edema when there is an inappropriate fluid administration. There is no requirement to give pre to preload these patients prior to uh, giving a spinal blockade or, or anything. It is better we co-load them that too, not around 20 or 30 ml per kg. You give uh, around uh, uh, a routine uh, 3 ml per kg of uh, crystalloid. You start your uh, spinal anesthetic and you treat your hypotension with your vasopressors. And now the recommended vasopressor of choice is alpha agonist, namely the phenylephrine depending on your heart rate and BP. These uh, things will uh, uh, avoid pulmonary edema in the post postpartum period. Then, then there is, should be, as I told you, vigorous treatment of hypotension with your vasopressors. When we look at the respiratory system changes, there is an, because of the estrogen and because of the increased uh, 
total body water there is engorgement of the respiratory mucosa not only the respiratory mucosa all the mucosa are going to be enlarged and there is hypervascularity of the uh, so submucosal spaces and because of the increase in the mucosa and the vascularity what happens to the airway spaces they often get reduced and in addition to that when they are going into labor what happens is every time they strain the, and uh, there is a valsalva maneuver there is an upper airway edema that gets sets in so a uh, malamati score which was 2 could become 3 following prolonged induction of labor and when they are taking up for cesarean section so we have to every time when we see a patient it's very important to assess malamati score so that you be ready with your uh, difficult airway management protocols and when we look at respiratory mechanics, what happens to the, well, well let us go for, uh, systematically first from the skeletal system. What happens to the thoracic uh, cage? When we look at the thoracic cage uh, dimensions, there is an increase in the AP, AP diameters and the transverse diameter. This enlargement occurs because the, the hormone relaxin, what happens is it relaxes your ligaments, uh, your uh, sternal uh, costal ligaments so the bucket handle movements are uh, enhanced and then it moves be, one is there is elevation of your diaphragm from below and the second thing is relaxin uh, relaxes these ligaments and so their uh, uh, ap and transverse diameter gets uh, increased but the vertical this is a compensation for the decrease in vertical diameter of the thoracic cage that occurs following increase in the uh, increase the pushing of your diaphragm from below so what happens uh, to the type of respiration with these changes is predominantly it is a thoraco abdominal type of breathing and diaphragm is the main contributor of inspiration because the Inspiratory muscles, your external intercostals and the other intercostals play a very minimal role because already they are in an expanded position because of the increase in the AP and the transverse diameter. When you look at the other mechanics in flow of airflow limitations and flow volume loops, they do not change much and it is the same as uh, pre-pregnant levels. The only change that occurs is with regard to your functional residual capacity, your residual, your residual volume, or your expiratory reserve volume and your tidal volume. When you look at the overall total lung capacity, the total lung capacity remains the same. It is only the distribution of these volumes which gets altered, ultimately resulting in the uh, 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 increased incidence of hypoxemia. For example, as I told you, when there is an elevation, when there is a term gravid uterus, there is elevation of the diaphragm. This elevation of diaphragm causes decrease in functional residual capacity of about 20%. And when this patient goes to, uh, in the, this happens even in a sitting posture. Suppose the patient goes to lie down in the supine posture, there is further reduction in your FRC. So the uh, functional residual capacity is the one which is going to be enormously decreased when the patient lies supine especially more so when during neuraxial anesthesia and during transport of your patients. So though there is an increase in tidal volume by 45%, their functional residual capacity decreases by 25 to 30%. And as the functional residual capacity decreases beyond your closing capacity, your closing capacity is somewhere around 1000 ml. The closing capacity does not change. But because of your... Uh, a relationship between your uh, functional residual capacity and your closing capacity, there is a stoppage of uh, air exchange when the patient lies down in supine position because during tidal breathing, there is airway closure. This is predominantly because of your FRC decrease which occurs in the supine position. So they are prone for hypoxemia. It is very important to give Supplemental oxygen whenever these patients are put in supine position during neuraxial analgesia and during neuraxial anesthesia. When you look at the blood gas values, there is an, as I told you, there is an increase in minute ventilation. Increase in minute ventilation leads to decrease in your uh, carbon dioxide levels. The primary reason for decrease in uh, uh, PCO2 levels is because of your increase in minute ventilation, which is mediated by your progesterone and by your, uh, which ultimately leads to increased alveolar ventilation. In order to compensate for this, there is a excretion of bicarbonate levels. So the bicarbonate levels is always uh, in the range of 20 to 21 uh, 
milli equivalence per liter in any pregnant patient. So when you look at an, look at an ABG which shows a PCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury, then it denotes there is a hypercarpia which has settled in this patient and there is a respiratory failure which they could be type 1 or type 2. All pregnant patients will have uh, PCO2 only in the range of 30 to 32 millimeters of mercury. That is the carry home point. And when, uh, uh, and when there is uh, some insult to the metabolic component in terms of uh, acidosis or low volume, they are unable to uh, compensate this by their buffering capacity because there is an inherent decrease in the uh, level of uh, bicarbonate which is there. So the buffering capacity, so whenever there is a, a small amount of acid load which has been given to this patient, their buffering capacity decreases. In addition to this, why are they more prone for hypoxemia? Because the oxygen consumption, when you see, it is around 4 ml per kg per minute. And with regard to the fetoplacental unit, it is 12 ml per kg per minute. So though there is increase in tidal volume, minute ventilation, and your PaO2 is around 107 millimeters of mercury, whenever their tendency to desaturate is quite faster because the oxygen consumption is more. Number one, the consumption is more. Number two, their act uh, tidal breathing in the supine position, there can be airway closure. So the time to desaturate when you look is only four minutes, even after 99% uh, denitrogenation of these patients. And during labor, the increase in mineral ventilation, as I told you, is similar to cardiac output. This also increases by 142 to 200%. And because of this hyperventilation, the ODC curves the dissociation curve shifts to the left and there is a decreased unloading of the oxygen, which ultimately results in the fetal uh, 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 bradycardia or uh, decreased oxygen delivery to the fetus. And also hypocarbia will also decrease your uteroplacental insufficiency. Going on to hematological changes, physiological hypervolemia we already dealt with. There is often anemia of pregnancy, which is present only in the first and the second trimester. And during the third trimester, the plasma volume increase is not much. So the hemoglobin concentration naturally increases more during the third trimester. And your total count is roughly about six to 16,000 cells per cubic millimeter, which would be the normal limit, unlike a pre-pregnant value of 6,000 to 9,011. And when you look at the platelets, well, coagulation system, this is a phase where the platelet production is more, but at the same time, the platelet turnover is going to be high. There is accelerated consumption of uh, platelets. The, the count might be low or normal, and they, but the platelet function seems to be normal in most of these patients uh, who do not have other coexisting diseases such as abruptio placente or a severe uh, ELP syndrome or a PIH. There is a and when you look at the clotting factors, all the clotting factors are increased except your prothrombin, prothrombin and your factor 5. The, the phenomenal increase in clotting factor which occurs is your fibrinogen levels, which increase to about 450 milligrams per deciliter. Because of this increase, when you do a routine conventional PT-APT test, they could be normal. Even after uh, some amount of uh, blood volume has lost, the coagulation factors are not very sensitive to the amount which is lost. So till only around 40% of the reduction occurs, these uh, things will be showing a normal value because there is accelerated amount which is present. So it is very important you use dynamic test of coagulation to assess the quality of the strength uh, in a bleeding patient rather than go for uh, conventional test. Next thing to decrease is your decrease in your fibrin stabilizing factor. So there is an activated uh, clotting time but at the same time, the fibrinolysis is also more and there is a decrease in fibrin stabilizing factor. So once the hemorrhage sets in, there is activated fibrinolysis. So this is the reason you have to give uh, tranexamic acid in patients prior to the as a first drug of choice in any patient with postpartum hemorrhage. And your target levels for uh, fibrinogen should be, in a case of massive hemorrhage, it should be at uh, around 200 to 250 milligrams per deciliter, unlike 150 milligrams in any other normal patient. When you look at obstetric physiology, as I told you, it's a hyper, hypercoagulable state. Blood volume is increased. Stroke volume, heart rate, SVR, they are all decreased. So it improves your, the loss is rapid. The uterine flow is 700 ml per minute. It is a so, sorry, 900 ml per minute. It is a source for rapid blood loss and it can quickly become life-threatening. But 
when you look at the physiology it is it is uh, actually adapted and compensated for this blood loss and so massive obstetric hemorrhage can occur without warning and when you look at the neuraxial changes there is an exaggerated lordosis this exaggerated lordosis makes what does that do it often leads to technical difficulty in identifying your interspinous space because it gets narrow the other thing which happens is because of your increased weight gain and an increase in plasma volume there is some amount of edema so technically palpation of your spaces becomes very difficult and you have to angle and there is softening of the ligaments so identification of epidural space during uh, by a loss of resistance technique is it is very tricky because every uh, segment uh, every segment as you advance it will all be soft, softening and there can be increased incidence of intrathecal puncture and when you give a spinal blockade in the lateral position because of the widening of the pelvis if the, if you do not adjust the table what happens is there be more cephalite spread of the drug and uh, this is a, a study where they have done mri of uh, uh, parturients where uh the vertebral venous plexus were studied what they found was there was when you look at these uh, white arrows these are the vertebral venous plexus when you look at the these venous plexus they are engorged veins in the ventral epidural space and they are present bilaterally on both sides and these uh, uh, veins what do they do is they were compressing the subarachnoid space this compression of the subarachnoid space was observed more at the lower levels of space for example l4 and l5 than at l1 and l2 and they often crossed at the middle of the vertebra and the veins narrowed the foramens at each level this engorged vertebral venous plexus is responsible to a certain extent for the decreased frequency and in addition because of the subarachnoid uh, space getting compressed in the l4 and l5 space when you give a spinal the rate of paresthesia during spinal puncture is also quite high in pregnant women and uh, there is often a technical difficulty which we have already told there is softening of ligaments and increased incidence of vascular puncture because one is engorgement second it is bilaterally present and second it is also present in the midline and uh, so the every time you give a epidural dose for analgesia it is very important you consider that as a test dose like 0.0625% or a 0.125% should be given in incremental doses because the migration of the catheter and uh, staining is quite common in parturing patients and 25% uh, dose reduction of local anesthetics is also essential and when we look into the central nervous system changes there is often a quite a, a enormous amount of endorphins which are uh, increased during pregnancy and progesterone as such is it is a central nervous system depressant these two effect, these two uh, neurohormonal effects ultimately what do they cause they increase the pain sensitivity of pregnant mothers the map of inhalational agents is quite decreased so when you give a 0.6 or 0.4 0.6 mac or 0.7 mac that is going to be a, when there is a 30% reduction it is equivalent to 1 mac and there can be uh, some amount of uterine tony or a upper airway obstruction which which can occur when you are holding a mask and also there is increased uh, sensitivity to your intravenous induction agents for example when you give propofol as it is your systemic vascular resistance is decreased propofol further decreases it so there is a increased incidence of hypotension during propofol induction uh, especially during induction of anesthesia so all these things have to be kept in mind during induction of anesthesia so that during induction you avoid iatrocable compression you give your phenylephrine propofol succinyl choline and repeated monitoring of your uh, blood pressures is very essential to avoid the maternal collapse inside the or and when look at the liver blood flow apart from all the other organs when you look at the flow in the liver it is blood flow to the liver is decreased by 30% but your portal venous pressure predominantly increases which ultimately is a reason for uh, spider nevi and telangiectasia which you observe in some of these pregnant women and now uh, of uh, important to us is your choline stress level and your albumin so albumin levels uh, uh, decreases by around uh, 25 to 30% and it is around 3.2 grams per liter and uh, because of which the colloidal cortic pressure decreases to 18 mm of mercury so though 
So, this, these patients are more prone for pulmonary edema. One is there is an increased plasma volume. The hydrostatic pressure is more. Second is the colloid oncotic pressure is less. And there, are, there can be leaky capillaries in addition if they are having PIH and all those things. And in judicious administration of uh, uh, fluids can, along with syntocin, can result in capillary escape and some amount of pulmonary edema. Though the cholinesterase level is reduced by 24%, we don't see a clinical uh, increase in uh, apnea time following administration of succinyl colon. And uh, when you look at the GIT system, uh, what are the things uh, you have to... We all know that uh, there is uh, these patients are uh, prone for gastric aspiration. The reason for gastric aspiration when you analyze is if the gastric volume gastric emptying time and the barrier pressure. These are the determinants ultimately, which will ultimately result in regurgitation and aspiration. So when you look at the gastric volume, the volume of acid that is secreted to a, in, a, in response to gastrin is not altered during pregnancy, but during labor, the volume can be more because of the pain and the sympathetic response. The next thing is your emptying time. Your emptying time also gets uh, prolonged only during labor. Use of opioids, which can be intravenous opioids or neuraxial opioids and stress. All these things can delay your gastric emptying time. And there is a pressure across the lower esophageal sphincter and the stomach, which is often called as the barrier pressure. This is an area where there is a high pressure zone which is there in the lower end of the esophagus. This pressure is called as the barrier pressure. Or routinely, there is a, this pressure is maintained because of the pinch valve mechanism of the intra-abdominal part of your esophagus. But during pregnancy, what happens is the stomach is pushed upward and there is alteration in your axis, so it gets rotated. Because of this, what happens is your abdominal part of your esophagus is pulled into your thorax. So the pinch valve mechanism is lost, which ultimately is responsible for your gastroesophageal reflex and silent regurgitation. So gastric motility is preserved. So alteration in your high pressure zone is responsible for the silent regurgitations which can occur. And also progesterone is also responsible for relaxation of your lower esophageal sphincter tone. And now when you look at the renal system, the serum uh, blood flow, the uh, renal plasma flow increases, your filtration rate is also more. So the response is your serum creatinine of 0.5 to 0.6 milligram per deciliter is normal. Any value more than this indicates that the patient may have gone in for acute renal failure. And, uh, and these patients have some amount of physiological uh, uh, glucose in their urine and uh, uh, diabetes should be screened only based on your oral glucose tolerance test and not on based on the urine sugar values. So, what are the take-home messages? Cardiovascular changes are the predominant changes that occur in a pregnant patient in terms of heart rate, stroke volume and cardiac output. The systemic vascular resistance decreases and your peripheral vascular resistance decreases. So, any patient who has caught a cardiac disease is going to decompensate during the course of uh, pregnancy and especially patients with stenotic lesions. Number two, if patients have got congenital asynotic and cyanotic heart disease, where your systemic vascular resistance and your ratio between SVP and PVP ultimately decides your perfusion, that is also going to be altered. So it is a very dynamic situation. The incidence of difficult airway is very common in any pregnant patient for all the respiratory changes which I told you. And they are prone for pulmonary edema. This for bleeding and coagulopathy is rapid. They have increased sensitivity to anesthetic agents. And neuraxial analgesia and anesthesia is technically difficult, but it is the most advantageous and the ideal thing to do in any pregnant patient, even when they have cardiac disease, and avoid iotocable compression at all times. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for an excellent presentation. And you have correlated the physiological changes with the clinical uh, outcome also. Thank you, madam. There are a few questions. Can we go to the questions, madam? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yes madam. So, so, first question is, what symptoms and signs we have to look for peripartal cardiomyopathy during antenatal period? Okay. So, somebody who complains of uh, dyspnea. So, disturbance so in radio. So somebody who 
there is a disturbance in your audio madam yeah okay and uh, fit to be can you hear me now is it audible uh, i now are audible you can uh, go yeah. okay any uh, any any patient who is having new onset of dyspnea has to be evaluated that is number 1 and peripartum cardiomyopathy most often uh, like uh, two to like most of our cases which we have seen in our institute either it is a diagnosed one because they had a complaint of dyspnea or during routine echocardiographic evaluation but sometimes what happens is they tolerate the, your labor pain very well and when they come for ps after giving a spinal anesthesia we have had two to three cases of arrest and most often when the when uh, after that when the screening echo was done it showed an ef of 20% so it's very difficult you, you should have a high index of suspicion whenever the patient has got new onset of symptoms and when there is unrelenting hypotension following your uh, uh, routine uraxial blockade we can uh, suspect but actually uh, unless uh, you do you screen all your pregnant patients with echocardiography it is very difficult to identify just based on uh, symptoms and signs alone that is that that's my uh, experience i would say okay madam so the second question how does the change in hormones affect the bone and joints especially in the rheumatic arthritis uh, rheumatic uh, uh, rheumatic arthritis patients rheumatic arthritis patients yes usually there will be relaxation of the joint uh, that is ligaments and joints but uh, what will happen in rheumatoid arthritis when you look at autoimmune diseases no all these autoimmune diseases especially they either uh, they will go in for remission or there will be an exacerbation so based on the symptom only we can uh, uh, we have to go ahead there is no specific precautions which we have to take uh, uh, I, i think the uh, the person wants to know whether we can give neuraxial anesthesia in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis or sld or rheumatic i, I think it is that uh, you are justified in giving these patients uh only thing is if if it is a severe involvement what happens is it can be a difficult regional anesthesia which that we have to anticipate and sometimes uh, the blockade also might not be as expected sometimes it will be a very high uh, uh, analgesia uh, very high levels of uh, segmental blockade can be achieved because of the uh, other alterations in the uh, spinal canal uh, uh, drug pharmacokinetics which can occur okay but i think uh, yes The third uh, question. I'm not sure whether I've answered the uh, what the. We don't know what is the mind of the prisoner. It may be. Okay. I think it may be whether it is difficult to perform the neuraxial block in rheumatoid arthritis in pregnancy. I I don't know. The third question okay. is regarding the. It depends on the course of the disease. For example, somebody okay. who is a chronic rheumatoid arthritis with uh, with uh, deformities in their small joints, then definitely they will be a both a difficult airway and a difficult regional. okay so whenever uh, you are dealing with rheumatoid arthritis patient you have to be prepared for your difficult airway and choose a very small size tube because arytenoid dislocation is the most uh, dreaded complication which you see in these patients so we have to be aware of this uh, so just like that uh, from even if you have a video laryngoscope even if you have all the adjuncts it should be a atraumatic intubation and it is always uh, advisable to use a the size of the tube which is uh, smaller one size smaller even a six size tube would be sufficient in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and uh, with regard to neuraxial anesthesia yes it is difficult ultimately it is only the experience of the of the person who is doing it and the level of uh, disease uh, which ultimately decides the success i would say okay madam so we move on to the next question regarding the supine hypertension syndrome of pregnancy the 30 degree tilt will it be convenient for the surgeon to perform the surgery and yeah, uh, another so, question is uh, will it cause a unilateral spinal anesthesia no. very often pregnancy we are all safe because even with 1.8 ml the moment uh, the moment you put your put your patients down to supine position you will see the uh, level of blockade achieving that is the advantage we have so there are no instances of uh, unilateral spinal blockade in pregnancy provided technically we have given it correctly okay so there is if you if the spinal is not working in an lcs it means it is to do with the performer rather than the drug or the uh, patient i would say and uh, the second thing is uh, iota cable compression yeah some of the surgeons they do agree for the uh, 30 degree 
some of them what we do is at the time of delivery of the baby uh, for because unless they delivery they deliver the baby we can't relieve the hypotension so we just take out the wedge for that reason also at that time we we do take out okay because uh, it is uh, all uh, ultimately the surgeon has to deliver the baby so we have to give them that wedge okay so the, the dose reduction of neuroxyl but uh, most importantly uh, you have to treat uh, hypotension vigorously that is uh, very important because now uh, uh, there is a debate going on whether you have to keep a wedge in all patients if you are maintaining your hemodynamics uh, it is not necessary to to keep a wedge in lateral tilt and all these things so the most important thing is treat your hypotension vigorously that is uh, the most important so that your blood flow is uh, maintained and uh, ultimately the surgeon also will be very fast in delivering the baby if you are if you are not uh, compromising on the uh, tilt yes the reason concept is if the patient is normovolemic you need not keep yeah. it uh, yeah normovolemic and low risk patient you do not uh, yes. uh, keep thank you madam the, the dose reduction of uh, neuroxyl anesthesia of 25% when we have to start madam only 24 to 40 48 hours postpartum after that what happens is uh, you have to give a regular volume of drug for your pupil sterilization of this okay thank you madam thank you very much for your excellent okay. explanations and we will move on to the second topic that is uh, the second topic is anesthetic management of non obstetric surgeries in pregnant patient by dr vinith gupta he is a consultant anesthetic anesthesiologist affiliated to cloud9 hospital aplo Cradle Hospital and Affordil Armitage Hospital. He has worked in in India and abroad as clinicians in dealing with cases of obstetrics, bariatric, plastic, and reconstructive operative procedures. His major area of interest is labor and general anesthesia in obstetric anesthesia. The anesthetic technique is almost forgot by by our postgraduate. That is general anesthesia in obstetric anesthesia. He is expert in that. and he has written articles in the various topics of anesthesia for students by the name of quick dose he is the uh, at present the secretary of iisc city branch of gurugram and he is present vice president of the most prestigious tas society that is the anesthetic society over to you sir good morning friends uh, thank you very much dr edward uh, for giving my uh, introduction uh i am humbled by your um, way of uh, introducing me to the book to the uh, platform uh, thank you very much akila ma'am uh, it was a very very nice presentation and it reminded me of my spend days physiology should be treated and taught like this thank you very much dr akila so uh, here i will be starting my screen share and i'll start my presentation okay can share uh can everybody see my presentation now yes it's yes, visible sir okay so the, the topic uh, given to me today is anesthetic management of non obstetric surgery in pregnant patient you see this uh, topic is usually uh, uh, bring down uh, shivers into the uh, slide is not moving hello slide is not moving sir Trying to move my slide. Yes, okay. now it's moving, sir. Okay, moving, moving, sir. So it brings down shiver to your spine once you know that uh, there is a patient coming for acute appendicitis and she is being posted for laparoscopic appendectomy and she is three month pregnant or six month pregnant or whatever it is, term pregnant or early pregnancy, whatever it is. So the thing is, you must know few things to tell patient and to counsel patient about. um all these things because stress management your as a clinician as well as of the patient is very very important for this kind of surgeries in in pregnancy 
So frequency is usually uh, 0.3 to 2.2 percent. It's varied from place to place, and uh, 2 percent to somewhere it is written 2.2 percent to 3 percent. But usually it is, uh, if we take roughly, it is 2 percent. So in 2010, UK National Patient Safety Agency said that women should be offered a pregnancy test if there is any possibility that the woman could be pregnant. If she is coming for a surgical indication, she should be offered a pregnancy test. The other uh, good recommendation was American Society of Anesthesiologists Task Force on pre-anesthesia evolution states that this is actually uh, taking low on offload uh, from the treating doctors or treating anesthesiologists that literature is inadequate to inform patient or physician on whether anesthesia causes harmful effect in early pregnancy. See what happened. Once this, patient, this kind of patient is there with, with us and if surgeon calls us or if a protein manager calls us, we take every uh, load on us. We start thinking of like we are putting patient on danger. No, it's not like that. We are actually helping the patient in crucial time. So, <clears throat> start thinking positively that we are not going to harm the patient. Our technique, our anesthesia drugs are as safe as others. And we are the safest mode of providing medical treatment during the surgery. And whatever drugs we are going to use, whatever techniques we are going to use are very, very safe. So this will actually offload you from the, from the stress you are going through. And once you are offload from the stress, once you are going to talk to that patient, the patient will be very comfortable, they will be stress-free. And stress and anxiety has a very big role on these kind of patients. Once you are convinced, you will convince your patient. Once your patient is convinced, your half job is done. So the surgeries commonly performed during pregnancy are directly related with pregnancy like cervical circlas, and then indirectly related with pregnancy like ovarian cystectomy, Unrelated to pregnancy, like appendicectomy, trauma, or acute abdominal. Possible risk to the fetus of antenatal surgeries. The effect of the disease process itself or related therapy. Then the teratogenicity of the anesthetic agent or other drug administered during the perioperative period. So this is a, a, a very subtop, big to, subtop, subtopic of this topic, teratogenicity of the anesthetic agent. We will be talking little, at little length on this topic. Then intraoperative changes of placental perfusion and or fetal oxygenation. Most of it has been, uh, I mean, discussed with Dr. Kalindirish Shri, but we will still revise it during our presentation. Then the risk of abortion or fetal delivery. The outline of the today's class is one, first, the maternal safety, altered maternal physiology, second is fetal consideration, and third is the practical considerations. Maternal safety or altered maternal physiology, as uh, ma'am already discussed, there are five main systems which are affected uh, physiologically. Once the, one is the respiratory system, acid-base balance, second is cardiovascular, third is blood volume and blood constituent, Fourth is GI and first is altered response to anesthesia. So we will take in broad line. Alveolar ventilation increased by 30% as NPSU2 runs between 28 to 32%, slightly alkaline 7.44. Conjunction increased by uh, a little bit, uh, slightly remains within the normal range. Functional residual capacity diminishes by approximately 20% as the uterus expands, resulting in decreased oxygen reserve and potential for airway closure. This all is already discussed very nicely on the topic. When FRC is decreased further from morbid obesity, perioperative intraabdominal distension, placement of uterus in the patient in the supine, tendalimbic position, or lithotomy position, or induction of anesthesia. Airway closure may be sufficient to cause hypoxia. And that is the important point. Respiratory system, weight gain during pregnancy, capillary engorgement, causes respiratory tract, mucosa uh, uh, engorgement, and difficult intubation. Failed intubations are more, more uh, frequent during um, pregnancy. Decrease FRC, increase oxygen consumption, and diminished buffering capacity result in rapid development of 
hypoxemia and acidosis during period of hypoventilation or apnea. Failed intubation is, is very uh, important point uh, or difficult intubation is very important point uh, while we are dealing with these kind of patients under general anesthesia. My personal experience is uh, try your best. Like if you are tentative, you have some done uh, conventional laryngoscopy and you see uh, only a lower half or, or lower one third of the, uh, the larynx visible to you. You think that you may or may not be able to negotiate the tube in the first instance. It's better to start with bougie because there is no point trying once, traumatizing the mucosa and then trying with the second chance with the with this uh, bougie or stellate. It's better to start with the bougie and go in one go because Intubation done in first go or one go is the best policy in pregnant patient. Never try. Use the best experience hand with the, for the intubation. You can teach your students anywhere or any patients. You can see uh, teach them through the video laryngoscope. Even if uh, you are teaching your resident, use the third year resident at least to intubate the patient. Nothing personal, nothing offensive to the junior students. They will also do it once the turn, turn will come. Induction of inhalational anesthesia occurs more rapidly during pregnancy because alveolar hyperventilation and decrease FRC allow faster equilibrium of inhaled effluent. Induction of anesthesia is accelerated owing to 30 to 40 percent decrease in the minimum alveolar concentration for volatile anesthetic agent that occurs during early pregnancy. Cardiovascular changes, 50% uh, cardiac output increases because of heart rate and, and stroke volume. We know the uh, systemic pulmonary vascular resistance decreases. Important point is by 24 week gestation, most of the physiological uh, changes of uh, cardiovascular system has happened. But out of these 24 weeks, first eight weeks are very important. Because 57% of the increase in cardiac output, 78% of the increase in stroke volume, and 90% of the decrease in systemic vascular resistance has already happened in the first eight weeks of gestation. So, first trimester of the pregnancy is very much important regarding the geological changes of pregnancy. During the second half of the gestation, the uterus compresses the inferior vena cava and venous return decrease by 30%. In some women, frank hypotension may occur in supine position. Vena cava compression, as you know, uh, we cause distension of epidural venous plexus. It increases the likelihood of, of intravascular injection, local anesthetic during epidural anesthesia. We have to be very careful and sophisticated and gentle in our regional anesthesia techniques. These kind of patients. Changes in blood volume and blood constituents. Blood volume expand in the first trimester and increase 30 to 45 percent by term. Dilutional anemia occur as a result of smaller increase in red blood, blood cell volume and then in plasma. Volume. Pregnancy is associated with benign leukocytosis. In general, pregnancy has a hyperprogloblin state with increase in the fibrinogen factor 7, 8, 10, and 12 and fibrinogen degradation product. Although there is thrombocytopenia, but some pregnant, in some pregnant women, these patients may still be hypercoagulated. During the post-operative period, pregnant period, pregnant surgical patients are at high risk of thromboembolic complications. Thus, thromboembolism profile access is recommended. VI system, incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter and distortion of gastric and pyloric anatomy during pregnancy increases the risk of GI reflux despite similar gastric emptying rates in the pregnant and non pregnant patient. Although lower esophageal sphincter tone is impaired early in pregnancy, the mechanically induced factor do not become relevant until later in the pregnancy. It's prudent to consider any pregnant patient as having a higher risk for aspiration after mid gestation. This is my personal experience that one patient given a history of empty stomach for 12 hours and she vomited like anything. So my humble request or teaching to everyone is always consider a pregnant patient free stomach. 
Some anesthesia provider believe the pregnant women are at increase of risk of aspiration from the beginning of the second trimester onwards. Then alternate response to anesthesia, NAC decrease, more exp expensive neural blockage attained with the epidural and spinal anesthesia in pregnant patient because of the engorgement of the space. Plasma cholinesterase level decreases by 25% from the early pregnancy to the seventh post-operative day. Fortunately, prolonged neuromuscular blockage with section and choline is uncommon. Decreased protein binding associated with, associated with lower albumin and alpha glycoprotein concentration to the pregnancy may result in larger fraction of unbound drug with a potential for greater drug toxicity during pregnancy. Then pregnancy associated with changes in volume of distribution due to change in body composition and or plasma protein binding capacity, mm -hmm. metabolic activity and hepatic or renal impairment elimination may contribute to the change in drug effects and metabolism. Then this is the physiological part. The next part is the fetal consideration. So actually our uh, lectures, today's lecture is starting from there. It is divided into three main parts, risk of teratogenicity, fetal effect of anesthesia, and prevention of late labor. So first we will deal with the serious risk of teratogenicity. Most teratologists accept that the principle that any agent can be teratogenic in an animal provided that enough is given at right time. That means a small dose of teratogen may cause malformation or death in the susceptible early embryo, whereas much larger, do larger doses may prove harmless to the fetus. It is the time of organogenesis, early first trimester pregnancy is the time of organogenesis and it is the, it is the time or stage where it is, it is very common to, for every, any drugs to be uh, acting as a teratogen. Risk of teratogenicity, uh, see, you can see the increasing dose, more preference to teratogenic uh, zone to embryolytal zone to maternal lethal zone. So you can see uh, uh, teratogenic uh, zone is ending while embryo lethal zone is uh, full fledged. It is because uh, when embryo is uh, died, nobody is going to, to, to see the teratogenicity of the died embryo actually. So, uh, and it, it, can, it cannot be manifested once the baby is not uh, delivered. So teratogenicity is uh, studied only in the embryos who are born live or, or, or evaluated well. Then uh, once the doses process embryolethal zone and embryo is also died, then start affecting even the maternal um, population. Risk of teratogenicity, manifestation of teratogenicity include death, structural abnormality, growth restriction, and functional deficiency. Death is referred to as abortion, fetal death, or still work, birth in human and as a fetal resorption in animal. Structural abnormalities can lead to death if they are severe, although death may occur in the absence of congenital anomalies. Growth restriction is considered a manifestation of teratogenesis and may relate to multiple factors, including placenta insufficiency and genetic and environmental factors. Then functional deficiency include a number of behavioral and learning abnormality, the study of which is called behavior teratology. Then risk of teratogenicity, uh, this picture is very good uh, uh, depiction of teratogenicity. You can see first two weeks, they are period of dividing zygote, implementation, uh, implantation and bilaminar embryo. No susceptible to teratogenicity because they will die then and there. <clears throat> then from third to eighth of week, <clears throat> we can see central nervous system and heart in third week, fourth week, eye, heart, and limbs, and then fifth week, eye, sixth, teeth and ear, then plate, palate, then ear. We can see the, uh, the dark bars and, and then followed by the light bars in the same uh, area. The dark bar is higher susceptibility and the, 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 the light bars are actually the lowering susceptibility. But important point is uh, brain. You can see the brain even it is affecting once the patient, the, the fetus is full term. So we have to be very careful about all those things. Most structural abnormalities result from exposure during the period of organogenesis, which extends from approximately day 31 to 37. 
that that means uh, uh, almost 10 weeks 9 10 weeks uh, that is the most uh, susceptible period for teratogenicity functional deficiencies are usually associated, associated with exposure during the late pregnancy or even after birth because the central nervous system continue to mature during this period then the incidence of congenital anomalies among human is approximately 3% most of which are unexplained and out of that only 2 to 3% with the drugs and environmental chemicals indeed shepherd has listed several criteria for determining that an agent is a human teratogen including the following only these criteria will tell us that the particular drug is teratogen or not one to one exposure to the agent at the critical time of development two consistent finding in two or more high quality epidemiological studies three careful delineation of the clinical cases ideally with the identification of a specific defect or syndrome and an association that makes biological sense the list of agents or factors that are proven human teratogen does not include anesthetic agents so are you happy now which are listed as unlikely teratogen or any drug routinely used during the course of anesthesia so this is the point so i was uh, i was uh, um, giving uh, my uh, importance that why it is important for you or for us to be to be stress free while dealing with this pressure then once you know that none of your drug is actually teratogen you will be feel being comfortable you will be convincing with your act with your drugs your process your machinery and then you will convince your patient that madam don't worry we are using with very safe drugs and it's not going to affect adversely non drug factor encountered in the perioperative period derangement of normal physiology hypoxia hypercapnia stress and abnormality of temperature and carbohydrate metabolism congenital anomaly especially involving the cns have repeatedly been associated with maternal fever temperature is very important usually the uh, temperature of fetus is 0.5 to 1 degree centigrade higher than the maternal temperature and once uh, mother have a fever membranic oxidative stress from the reactive oxygen species has been implicated as one of the mechanism involved in the teratogenicity of many agents second the chronic hypoxemia experienced by mother at high altitude result in the delivery of infants with lower birth weight but with no increase in the rate of congenital defects it will only affect the birth weight then maternal stress and anxiety are teratogenic teratogenic in animal but their significance in, as human teratogens remains questionable severe hyperglycemia and prolonged hypoxia and hypercarbia have caused congenital anomalies in laboratory animals but there is no evidence to support teratogenicity after brief episodes episodes in humans so brief episodes is not going to harm as we think it may be then diagnostic procedure ionizes radiation is a human teratogen that can result in an increased dose related risk for malignant disease genetic disease congenital anomalies of fetal death the effect of radiation are often classified as being deterministic and stochastic deterministic effects are dose related and observed above a certain threshold due pregnancy loss growth restriction mental retardation or organ malformation in contrast Stochastic effects are possible at any level of exposure with no minimum threshold, but with the likelihood of worsening effect at higher doses. Radiation is expressed as gray or milligrays. One gray is equal to hundred red and is evaluated as cumulative dose. That is background radiation and medical diagnostic radiation throughout the entire pregnancy. In contrast to the negligible risk of teratogenicity, observational study suggests that there is a slightly higher risk for childhood cancer at radiation doses greater than or equal to 10 mg so 10 mg is very important figure i will show you a few of the uh, the charts or commonly uh, done exposures during pregnancy possible pregnancy and possible exposure and how it is relevant 10 mg you see the first uh, table and you can see the uh, the first line is of minimum exposure and the second line is of maximum exposure So, so, so the 10 milligram, uh, 10 milligram exposure uh, is crossed only by intravenous urogram, lumbar spine, X-ray, 
Then fluoroscopic examination, it is the barium enema, not barium meal, because it is upper GI. Then computer tomography, almost all abdominal, and then pelvic uh, CT scans. Then estimated fetal radiation exposure for common inter interventional radiological procedures. It is ERCP, it, re it can reach to 55.9 milligrays, and then uh, 42 uterine fibril embolization. So here we have to be very careful while we are doing uterine fibroid embolization, 42 uh, milligrays uh, is the minimum uh, estimated um, exposure. So we have to be very careful and uh, judic judicial about choosing this procedure. The non drug factors encountered in the perioperative period in intravenous iodinated contrast media, it can cross the placenta, go to the fetus, can cause hypothyroidism in the fetus. Then diagnostic ultrasonography usually considered very safe but, and uh, intensities up to 20 watt per centimeters have been found to be safe. However, when higher intensities, more than 30 watt per centimeters uh, have been used or when repeated exposure have been occurred during early pregnancy, postnatal neurobehavioral effect have been described. Again, neurobehavioral effect is directly related with the temperature. Ultrasound created uh, creates, uh, actually increases the temperature or hypothermia, and uh, that, will, that will affect actually the uh, neurobehavioral uh, changes in, in fetal uh, brain. So Doppler interrogation uh, uh, emits significantly more acoustic intensity than pulse echo imaging equipment, thus more heat is generated. Therefore, Doppler technology should be used judicially, keeping the exposure time and acoustic output to the lowest level possible. However, gadolinium-based MRI contrast agent readily cross the placenta, no adverse effect on pregnancy and neonatal outcome was noted in a small series of patients. The American College of Radiology recommends that intravenous gadolinium be avoided during pregnancy and used only if absolutely essential. In commonly used uh, anesthetic agents, systemic agents, human studies, I will only be uh, talking about human studies, these kind of agents. Teratogenesis has not been associated with the use of any of the commonly used induction agents, including barbiturates, ketamine, and benzodiazepines. When they were administered in local clinical doses during anesthesia, similarly, no evidence support the teratogenicity of opioids in humans. There is no increase in the incidence of congenital anomalies among offsprings of mother who use morphine or methadone during pregnancy. No evidence suggests that a single dose of benzodiazepines, midazolam, during the course of anesthesia is harmful to the fetus. Local anesthetic, no evidence support, erythrogenicity associated with any local anesthetic used clinically in humans. Maternal cocaine abuse is associated with adverse reproductive outcome, including abnormal neonatal behavior, and in some reports, a higher incidence of congenital defects of the genital urinary and GI tracts. The greatest risk to the fetus most likely results from the high incidence of placental abruption associated with maternal cocaine use. Commonly used anesthetic agents, muscle relaxants, given the fetal blood concentration of muscle relaxants are only 10 to 20% of maternal blood concentration. These drugs appears to have a wide margin of safety when administered to the mother during organogenesis. Many women have received muscle relaxant for several days during late gestation without adverse effect on the neonate. One case report uh, described arthrogryposis, that is persistent joint flexor in the in the infant of a woman with tetanus who received d coronary for 19 days, beginning at 55 days of gestation. The patient also was hypoxic and received multiple other deaths. So uh, the contributory factors were also there. Then inhalational anesthetics, occupational exposure to waste anesthetic agent, the most consistent risk associated with occupational exposure was spontaneous abortion, which carried a relative risk uh, ratio of 1.3. Shirangi et al. proved that prevalence of preterm birth in women exposed to unscavenged anesthetic gases was 7.3% compared with 5.7% 5%, in general population. Other studies have not confirmed an association with, bet, uh, between operation room work and higher reproductive risk. Similarly, in a 10-year 
prospective survey of all female physicians in the United Kingdom span found no difference in reproductive outcome when anesthesiologists were compared with other working female physicians who had not exposed to anesthetic uh, anesthetic gases. Overall, the epidemiological data do not support an increased risk for congenital anomalies with long-term exposure to nitrous oxide. Then studies of operation performed during pregnancy. Although anesthesia and surgery are associated with high incidence of abortion, fetal growth restriction and perinatal mortality, these adverse outcomes can often be attributed to the procedure, the, surge, the site of the surgery and or the underlying maternal condition. So we need not to blame or to doubt always on ourselves, our technique, our medicines. Uh, we, there are some contributory factors and there are some uncleared uh, actual uh, etiology uh, related with all these out adverse outcomes. Evidence does not suggest that anesthesia during pregnancy results in an overall increase in congenital abnormalities, and there is no evidence of relationship between outcome and type of cancer. Then behavior, ter behavioral teratology currently use general anesthetic agent X by one of the two principal mechanisms. One, the potentiation of GABA A receptor, that is benzodiazepines, volatile uh, hallucinated agent, and barbiturate, and two, the antagonism of NMDA receptors, nitrous oxide, and ketamine. CNS may be specifically uh, sensitive to such influences during the period of major myelination, with, which in human extends from fourth intrauterine month to the second postnatal month. So again, emphasis is on the second postnatal month, CNS. CNS is very, very uh, uh, important because that is the only system which, in fact, uh, being affected even postnatally. After a review of the data, a public hearing in March 2007, the Anesthetic and Life Support Drugs Advisory Committee of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration stated that currently there are not adequate data to extrapolate the animal findings to humans. It is also imp important to remember that painful stimuli per se can cause long-term behavioral changes. Then fetal effect of anesthesia. Maternal and fetal oxygenation. Transient mild to moderate decrease in maternal PO2 are well tolerated by the fetus because fetal hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. One second, severe maternal hypoxia may result in fetal hypoxia and if persistent may cause fetal death. Second is actually uh, uh, oxygen dissociation time. Fetal PO2 never exceeds 60 millimeter of Ig even when maternal PO2 increases to 600 mm of Ig because of large maternal fetal oxygen tension gradient. Thus, intrauterine retroenteral fibroplasia and premature closure of ductal arteriosus cannot result from high level of maternal PO2. Maternal carbon dioxide and acid base status, maternal hypercapnia can cause fetal acidosis because fetal PaCO2 correlate directly with the maternal PaCO2. Although mild fetal respiratory acidosis is of little consequences, severe acidosis can cause fetal myocardial depression and hypotension. Maternal hyperventilation with low maternal PaCO2 and high pH can adversely affect fetal oxygenation by means of several mechanisms. Respiratory or metabolic alkalosis can compromise maternal fetal oxygen transfer by causing umbilical artery constriction and by shifting the metal oxygen hemoglobin dissociation part to the left. Thus, hyperventilation should be avoided in the pregnant surgical patient rather than PSO2 should be kept in the normal range of pregnancy. Maternal hypotension from any cause can jeopardize uteroplacental perfusion and cause fetal hypoxia. The most common cause of hypotension in the pregnant patient undergoing surgery include deep level of general anesthesia, Sympathectomy with high level of spinal or epidural blockage, autocoval compression, hemorrhage, and hypoxia. A meta analysis of randomized controlled trial comparing ephedrine and with phenylephrine for the treatment of hypotension during spinal anesthesia for caesarean delivery resulted in the following conclusion. There was no difference between phenylephrine and ephedrine for the prevention and treatment of maternal hypotension. That means they are equally effective. Uh, treating maternal hypotension. 
Maternal bradycardia was more likely to occur with phenylephrine. Actually, they wanted to say that tachycardia is less with phenylephrine. Women given by phenylephrine had neonates with higher umbilical arterial blood pH measurement, which is which seems to be a little bit uh, favorable uh, to the to the uh, fetus. There was no difference between two vasopressors in the incidence of two fetal acidosis. Umbilical artery pH less than uh, 7.2 is both of them are not uh, cannot be blamed for, for the pH less than 7.2. Supporting the hypothesis that the lower fetal pH observed with ephedrine is related to um, the metabolic effect secondary to stimulation of beta, fetal uh, beta adrenergic receptor, the use of phenylephrine to treat maternal hypotension is acceptable and may be preferable to ephedrine. Fetal and neonatal outcome were unaffected when maternal uh, systolic blood pressure was capped between 70 to 80 millimeter of IG, even when pressure as low as 50 millimeter IG were briefly permitted. Pre-operative anxiety and light anesthesia increases circulating catecholamine level and possibly impairing uterine blood flow. So here it comes the uh, my point. Uh, I started my uh, discussion. Pre-operative anxiety that is very important. So if you deal with the pre-operative pre pre anxiety while counseling the patient, the outcome will always be always be very good. The relevance of data to the human mother under undergoing surgical surgery during pregnancy is not clear. Clinical experience does not support avoidance of volatile agents provided that the maternal hypertension is prevented. Indeed, the depressant effect of these agents on myocardial contractility may be beneficial. If intraoperative fetal heart rate monitoring reveals sign of fetal compromise, it may be advisable to discontinue volatile agents until the fetal condition improves. When fetal effect of systemic death, opioids and induction agent decreases FHR variability, this finding most likely signals the presence of anesthetized fetus and is not a cause of concern in the absence of maternal hypotension. Fetal heart rate variability, if it is decreasing with the opioid and induction agent, it does not matter if the patient's uh, maternal blood pressure is normal. Fetal respiratory depression is relevant only if caesarean delivery is to be performed at the same time as the surgical procedure. Otherwise, how does it matter if uh, a first trimester pregnancy is being treated for uh, appendicectomy and we are afraid of giving uh, fentanyl or opioid because we think that the fetal uh, respiration will be depressed. So what? Fetus is not going to, to breathe in, in, inside the mother womb. So how does it matter? Maternal administration of muscle relaxant and, uh, and reversal agent typically has not proved to be problematic for the fetus. Slow administration of anticholinesterase is recommended. That too, even after prior injection of an anticholinesterase, anticholinergic agent. Because the effect of reversal agents are unpredictable, the monitoring of HR during maternal drug administration is suggested. Prevent, then comes the third point, prevention of preterm labor. Although the volatile agent depresses myocardial irritability and thus are theoretically advantageous for the abdominal procedure evidence, does not show that any anesthet any one anesthetic agent or technique positively or negatively influences the risk of preterm labor. So, need not to worry about choosing your anesthetic agent or technique. Monitoring for uterine contraction may be performed intraoperatively with an external tocodynamometer when it is technically feasible. But be careful while applying it first time and if it is hampering the, the surgical procedure and if, if it will be delaying the surgery. Overall benefits actually is not much than the, the time taken. It's better to finish the surgery in 20 minutes than, than applying tachodynamometer for 20 minutes and then and delaying the surgery for two hours. A relatively new class of tocolytic agents, oxytocin receptor antagonist, that is atosiban, has been investigated. Atosiban selectively blends the calcium influx in the myometrium and thus inhibits the myometrial contractility. More or less, it will be working as nifedipine. Then magnesium sulfate is among the most common drug used in the pregnancy as a tocolytic, anticonvulsant, or fetal neuroprotective agent. Then comes the third most important uh, part of this topic, that is practical consideration, timing of the surgery. Elective surgery should not be performed during the pregnancy when possible. Uh, when possible, surgery should be avoided during the first time at especially during the period of organogenesis. 
second trimester is the optimal time to perform surgery because the risk for preterm labor is lowest at that time the management and timing of most acute surgical procedures should mimic that for the non pregnant person if the uh, the condition is acute and uh, if it is an emergency for the patient is pregnant appendicial perforation may be more common in pregnant patient than in non pregnant patient generalized peritonitis may also be more likely because increased steroid levels during pregnancy forget the patient is pregnant does not mean that you forget the patient is pregnant while you are taking a decision about the surgery that time you can keep that uh, point that patient is pregnant or non pregnant at the side and take the uh, the decision as if you are taking a decision for the non pregnant patient in the event of serious maternal illness the remote fetal risk associated with anesthesia and surgery are of secondary importance the primary goal is to preserve the life of the mother you save the tree you will get more fruits hypothermia induced hypotension cardiopulmonary bypass and liver transplantation have been associated with successful neonatal outcome what all surgical condition can put you on uh, on these kind of patient on surgical table or some of the are gynecological problem other are non gynecological problem gynecological problem like ovarian cyst tumor rupture torsion hemorrhage infection torsion of fallopian tube tubo ovarian mass uterine myomas degenerate that is degenerated infected and torched the non gynecological problem are acute appendicitis acute cholecystitis and its complications acute pancreatitis and its complication intestinal obstruction trauma with visceral injury or hemorrhage vascular accident ruptured abdominal aneurysm or peptical sphincter abdominal emergencies problem is abdominal emergencies are pregnancy mimic with the sign of acute abdomen like nausea vomiting constipation and abdominal distensions are common symptoms of both normal pregnancy and abdominal pathology then abdominal tenderness may be distinct indistinguishable from ligamentous or uterine contract some pain the white blood cell count in normal pregnancy may reach up to 15000 to 16000 per cubic millimeter it must be mildly elevated to be diagnostically helpful so again the diagnosis is hidden in between uh, behind the uh, the raised uh, normal count then reluctance to perform necessary imaginal uh, imaging studies involving radiation everyone is uh, afraid of uh, the radiation x ray or ultrasound or doing ct scan in these kind of patient sometimes the correct diagnosis is determined only at the time of operation then laparoscopy concern exists about the uh, effect of laparoscopy on fetal well being especially the risk are uterine or fetal trauma fetal acidosis from absorbed carbon dioxide decreased maternal cardiac output and utero placental perfusion resulting from an hypotonic increase in abdominal pressure but the benefits are shorter hospitalization less post operative pain decreased risk for thromboembolic and wound complications and faster return to normal activities including early return of normal gi function less uterine irritability and less fetal depression general anesthesia has been used in the vast majority of laparoscopic procedure with a rapid sequence induction followed by tracheal intubation and positive pressure ventilation to maintain and tidal co2 between 32 and 36 slightly higher uh, i mean normal uh, to to co2 level are uh, it's better to to keep them slightly to higher side or to the normal capnia side because uh, hyperventilation uh, accumulated see we want to flush out of accumulated co2 we do hyperventilate and we forget that the co2 has came down to 25 or 26 at that time there will be severe uh, fetal vascular uh, uh, perfusion compromise as with open surgery fetal well being is best preserved by maintaining maternal oxygenation acid base status and hemodynamic parameter within normal pregnancy limits the fhr in uterine tone should be monitored both before and after the surgery so there is a uh, suggested guideline for laparoscopy during pregnancy indication for laparoscopy treatment then uh, laparoscopy can be safely performed uh, pre operative obstetric consultation should be obtained intermittent lower 
extremity pneumatic compression device should be used fetal heart rate and uterine tone should be monitored and tidal co2 should be monitored left uterine displacement should be maintained to avoid autocable compression but to my experience uh, it's better to give surgeon a, a little liberal hand uh, while giving the position of the patient because once we give them liberty they they finish up very quickly and ultimately the results are good an open technique a vessel needle versus needle or an optic trocar technique may be used to enter the abdomen your pneumoperitoneum pressures between 10 to 15 mm wedge anyway we are keeping this much of pressure tocolytic agent should not be used prophylactically but should be considered an evidence of preterm labor is present then anesthetic management pre operative management medication may be necessary to allay maternal anxiety actually if you you convince and you talk to patient good 5 10 minutes you need not to give any uh, sedative or anti anxiety drug or medicine or something like that pregnant women are at increased risk for acid aspiration after 18 to 20 weeks of gestation pharmacological precaution against acid aspiration may include pre anesthetic administration of histamine receptor antagonist metoclopramide 10 mg iv and a clever clear non particulate antacids such as sodium citrate main choice of anesthesia maternal indication and consideration of the site and nature of the surgery should guide the choice of anesthesia no study has found an association between improved fetal outcome with any specific anesthetic technique when possible however local or regional anesthesia because it permits the administration of drug with no laboratory or clinical evidence of teratogenesis these techniques are suitable for cervical circlage and urological or extremity procedures most abdominal operation require general anesthesia because the incision totally typically extends to the upper abdomen then prevention of aortic cable compression beginning at 18 to 20 week gestation the pregnant patient should be transported on her side and the uterus should be displaced leftward when she is positioned on the operation table then monitoring usually maternal monitoring should include non invasive or invasive bp the ecg pulse oximetry technography temperature monitoring and use of peripheral nerve stimulator the fetal heart rate and uterine activity should be monitored both before and after the surgery intraoperative fhr monitoring may be considered when technically feasible then anesthetic technique general anesthesia mandates tracheal intubation at onwards 18 to 20 week gestation or if even if it is less than 18 to 20 week if the stomach is full the point is uh, we can go get away with the uh, supraglottic device in many of the uh, general anesthesia non pregnant patient but be careful while giving uh, using the supraglottic uh, airways uh, during early pregnancy denitrogenation should be uh, preceded in induction of anesthesia rapid sequence induction drug with a history of safe use during pregnancy include most of the commonly used agent like terpentone propofol porphyrin fentanyl succinyl and almost all non depolarizing muscle relaxants the commonly used uh, technique employ a high concentration of oxygen a muscle relaxant and opioid and or nitrous oxide particularly after the 6th week of gestation this uh, after 6th week of gestation is mainly emphasized for nitrous oxide and moderate concentration of volatile aluminum A cautious approach would restrict nitrous oxide administration to a concentration of 50% or less, and would limit its use in extremely long operations. Hyperventilation ventilation should be avoided. Rather, anti-tidal CO2 should be maintained in the normal range for pregnancy. Rapid intravenous venous infusion of 500 ml of crystalloid immediately before or during the initiation of spinal or epidural anesthesia seems prudent. Vessel pressure should be available to treat hypotension if it occurs. Maternal hypotension should be treated aggressively. Regardless of the anesthetic techniques, steps to avoid hypoxemia, hypotension, acidosis, and hyperventilation are the most critical element of the anesthetic management. Then, post-operative management, the fetal heart rate and uterine activity should be monitored during recovery for anesthesia. adequate analgesia should be ensured with systemic and urexial opioids acetamin and amphetamine or neuro neural blocker prophylaxis against venous thrombosis should be considered especially if the patients are immobilized 
Take home message are a significant number of women undergo anesthesia and surgery during pregnancy for procedure unrelated to delivery. Maternal risk are associated with anatomic and physiological changes of pregnancy, that is difficult intubation or respiration, and with the underlying maternal disease. The diagnosis of abdominal condition may be delayed during pregnancy, increasing the risk for maternal and fetal morbidity. Maternal catastrophe involving severe hypoxia, hypotension, acidosis poses the greatest acute risk to the fetus. Other fetal risks associated with uh, surgery include fetal loss, fetal labor, growth restriction, and low birth weight. Clinical studies suggest that anesthesia and surgery during pregnancy do not increase the risk of congenital anomalies. The point here is the brief period of exposure, actually. Uh, we should not blame the surgery and anesthesia per se for the, any kind of congenital anomalies if it is found later on after the delivery of the baby. It is unclear whether adverse fetal outcome results from the anesthetic, the operation, or the underlying maternal disease. No anesthetic agent is a proven teratogen in human, although some anesthetic agents, specifically nitrous oxide, are teratogenic in animals under certain conditions. Many anesthetic agents have been used for anesthesia during pregnancy with no demonstrable difference in maternal or fetal outcome. The anesthetic management of a pregnant surgical patient should focus on the avoidance of, again, hypoxia, hypotension, acidosis, and atomic condition. Thanks to my guru, my book, I am not a, a, a regular teacher in a medical college. I'm not a professor, so uh, I do not share, uh, I do not have a chance to share the knowledge, to get the knowledge from the college students, from the, from the fellow teachers. I have my guru, Chestnut Obstetric Anesthesia book, which I religiously follow for my obstetric anesthesia practice. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to, to speak about uh, this topic. Thank you, sir. You elaborately covered all the points regarding the non-obstetric surgery, sir. Thank you very much. There are questions in the chat box, sir. So most of the questions, they, they have discussed the answers in the you know, presentation itself. We'll go one by one, sir. So the drugs which can be used safely as sedation in pregnant patients outside the operation theater procedures. Outside the operation theater, uh, under, what, under what circumstances? They have mentioned MRI, remote area like MRI. So, so uh, if, if the, the point is same. Procedure is going on in a, whether it is going in an MRI suit or with, whether you are doing a surgery on, on a surgical table. When you can give that anesthetic agent or sedative agent, keeping the condition, maternal condition or vitals to the normal. It is immaterial when you, whether you give medazolam on, on surgical table or whether you give medazolam on, on an, an MRI table. Keeping the patient's blood pressure okay, saturation okay, giving an oxygen is good enough. So you can you can completely relaxly, very safely give uh, sedation to a patient, pregnant patient on MRI table. This type of drug is not important. You have to maintain the normal normal oxygen saturation. Okay. Yes. So another question is, which type of anesthesia is best in maintaining the uterine blood flow, whether it is a GA or RA? <laughs> it's controversial. But basically, it depends on the, uh, again, as I already told in my, in my lecture, it is, it is difficult to prove which kind of anesthesia is more important or, or more beneficial uh, for uterine blood flow. Because the, there are some indications for regional anesthesia and there are some uh, typical indications for general anesthesia. The point is whether we can get away without giving general anesthesia in a particular procedure, or whether we can get away giving uh, regional anesthesia for a particular procedure. If that procedure requires general anesthesia, we have to ensure giving general anesthesia with the safest mode of delivering oxygen to the fetus. That you can ensure by giving, of course, ensuring by maternal uh, good oxygenation, maintaining hypovolemia, uh, maintaining uvolemia, maintaining blood pressure, and CO2 level. If you, the usual mistake, what we do is we want to just flush out the CO2. We want to oxygenate the patient and, and in, in giving oxygenation, we hyperventilate the patient. Be careful while, we, while oxygenating the patient. In hurry of oxygenating the patient, 
whether you are not doing the uh, hyperventilation and washing out CO2, that will compromise the, the, the fetal circulation and, and later on uh, to the oxygen delivery to the fetus. That is okay. the Thank you. Next question is, what drugs are safe for the encirclage? It's not spinal overkill for the encirclage. Encirclage, uh, you know, uh, we are doing a lot of encirclage. Uh, we are a dedicated obstetric center. We are doing a lot of encirclages, like almost 10 circles in a month usually coming to us. Most of the patients, they are agree with, with the spinal, uh, like saddle block, or you, you give a saddle block and they are happy. But some patients are so uh, apprehensive about uh, early pregnancy. We safely give, very safely give general anesthesia to this patient, very short anesthesia. It takes five minutes to take uh, circles. You, you induce the patient with simple um, a glycopyrrolate or a simple analgesic like nephin, propofol, uh, and you maintain the oxygenation with supraglottic airway. Of course, when I case, ca say supraglottic airway, it is eye gel with, with side lumen, with catheterized side lumen, and it is connected with the suction, keeping in mind the risk of aspiration and keeping taking care of it. It is very safe to give general anesthesia to this early pregnancy patient and you can get away with, within 10 minutes. We are done. Okay, sir. So both of the anesthesia are equally safely possible for cervical anesthesia. Both are uh, safe. Okay, sir. So the nitrous oxide in inhalation anesthetist, are they prone to cause miscarriages when given for your long hours? Yes, for long hours, even uh, because studies have not proven it. But animal studies have shown that there are some uh, problems with the nitrous oxide. What we do if, if an emergency cesarean section turned up on my table and I had to give a GA, I do not open my nitrous oxide until the baby is delivered. Once the baby is delivered, I can start my nitrous oxide, but not before that. So the other two questions... You for, are a short, for a short surgery, yes, we can. We can like appendicectomy is doing. Uh, we are doing an appendicectomy. Here, we are doing an cholecystectomy. For a short period, yes, we can open nitrous oxide. Doesn't matter if it is not the first trimester pregnancy. So the time counts. Sir. Yeah, time counts, and and the time is there. first trimester. Yes, it's better to to go on opioids or any other analgesic than than uh, choosing the nitrous oxide. With the second trimester, you can yes, you can add nitrous oxide to to help actually reducing the MAC. Okay, sir. The other two questions you already answered. So, any precautions to prevent post-operative fetal uh, expulsion, that is miscarriages? See, once one uh, one thing we have to, to understand and to, to, to convince ourselves that though no anesthetic agent per se is pro-abortive patient, they actually hold the liver. They are uterine muscle relaxant. Every time uh, obstetrician while operating under general anesthesia, they used to tell us, please, sir, close the uh, inhalational anesthetic. Our uterus is getting relaxed. So how come this will uh, act as an abortive patient? Actually, it reduces the uh, uterine muscle relax uh, irritability. It will help us. So just don't worry about using the inhalational anesthetic. You are very safe while we are... And we have the most sophisticated agent available with us, sibochlorine and chlorine, isochlorine. All of them are very good. We are usually, we are mostly using sibochlorine and, and isochlorine. They are very safe agents. So is that fetal monitoring is essential for every surgery? It is not, not essential. It is suggested. But it should be documented preoperatively and postoperatively. Okay. That so is essential. Thank you, sir. There are some of the questions in the chat box. Thank you very much for your practical oriented presentation and also explanations. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Edward. Thank you very much. With that, we will uh, come to the end of this session. I thank the uh, sponsor, Akrula, and the, uh, and our uh, Anastasia TV and our A1 Logics. I also thank them. And next week, we are having the SARCA conference. So there will be no sessions in the next week because most of our post judges are attending that conference. There won't be any classes in the next week. We will meet the, the week next to SARCA. Thank you. Thank you, Anandal. With that, we will conclude this session. Thank you. Thank you, Anandal.